Hello and welcome once again to the Aftermath Podcast. This is Mick, the Doctor of Digital, and also we have Kendra, the co-parenting mentor. How are you today, Kendra? I am wonderful, Mick. I wish we were sitting next to each other like we were last week because that was so fun to do that podcast together. <laughs> Can you believe it? I could say yes. Kendra is real. She's an actual real person. So after a year of doing this together, we have our first year anniversary of the Aftermath. And then we also had 50 episodes as well, too. So it's quite a celebration here at the Aftermath. It is. It is. And now we're going to 51 episodes now. And so we're bringing in Megan Hunter from the High Conflict Institute. And she's going to talk to us today about con high conflict and how you, what it looks like to decrease that conflict and make it more reasonable. So especially for those that don't want high conflict in our divorces, right? It's hard to get away from it. We need advice. And that's yes. really why we wanted to get Megan on the program. We also talk about our supporters and sponsors. So I want to highlight Elizabeth McNeese, who has been with us before and represents a phenomenal organization, the National Parents Organization. She and her husband has worked on a documentary and that shared parenting documentary, We the Parents. It's the state of the courts through the eyes of the parents, which is really interesting. The 5th of November, it's a premiere. It's also going to be on the 14th of November. They're going to have it at the State House at Columbus, Ohio, just in case Kendra, maybe somebody from Ohio. Is that possible? Maybe that I might be in that video. Yes. And doing uh, the red carpet premiere. Aha. Uh -huh. So not only are you a podcast star, but you're also a documentary star. It's good to know. And it's great to have a co-host who is just as famous as you. So we're looking forward to that as well. So with that, we want to make sure that we bring Megan on. Megan, thank you so much for being our guest today. And you're going to talk about high conflict. Welcome to the program. Hello, and thank you for having me on your program. I'm awed to be on uh, a show with someone who is a podcast star and is going to be on the red carpet. <laughs> so, thank you. Welcome to The Aftermath, a podcast that rips the Band-Aid off the collective scars of divorce, custody battles, and the trauma of family drama. Kendra Ryber and Mick Smith pull back the curtain and explore stories that put the heart-wrenching puzzle pieces together with inspiring stories, notable experts, and actionable tips. Let the healing begin. Megan, one question we'd like to start with, because we are welcome to the program. Could you tell us a little bit about the high conflict interest? And that's why Kendra and I can kid a little bit about it. It seems obvious for us, but what is the High Conflict Institute? Long story short, I was the family law specialist at the Arizona Supreme Court, Administrative Office of the Courts, for many years, and I gained an interest in why all of the stakeholders in family law in my state of Arizona um, were struggling so much with handling high conflict divorce and child custody cases. Right. And it didn't seem that anyone in Arizona or in the world understood how to truly help families in a way that was meaningful. And so I made it my mission to figure it out. And so I stumbled across, quite accidentally, um, a man named Bill Eddy, who, had a, who was a licensed clinical social worker in his beginning of his career, and then eventually became a family law attorney and started to put some puzzle pieces together about high conflict family cases. So I found him and I thought, this guy has some solutions. And together we started the High Conflict Institute a little bit before 2008, but officially in, in 08. And we've been training professionals and helping parents and others worldwide ever since. Megan, thank you very much for founding it and working with Bill Eddy because we do appreciate it. So custody and parental alienation are two of the most common high conflict situations that you encounter. How do you help people manage through those? And what is that line maybe of high conflict versus just a typical divorce that's just a little rough? Yeah, good question. Because <laughs> No one really likes divorce. There are, we hear about, a, a few times we'll hear about people who just have a, an amiable divorce and yeah, we've agreed to everything, it's fine, and there's no conflict, and it's great. Uh, mostly rare, that that's how to be rare, Megan. <laughs> it is rare. We don't hear about those at High Conflict Institute, but I've heard they happen once in a while. Yeah. Um, however, uh, you know, all of us, if we're getting divorced, especially with kids involved, there's going to be some conflict and some of it can be situational. And even sometimes in, in a case that's not high, considered to be high conflict, like 
what we consider a high conflict case typically involves at least one person with a high conflict personality, which we can talk about too. But a high conflict case sometimes will involve maybe some abuse or violence or someone slams a door and then somebody wants an order of protection or whatever. A lot of times those are one-time incidents and they're not a pattern. And they happen in that the throes of divorce when things are yucky, but they don't last long and they get through them and then they co-parent pretty successfully. Whereas high conflict, it's a, it's a pattern that repeats itself over and over. And it's a combination of all or nothing thinking, unmanaged emotions, extreme behaviors. And then the key to it all is blame. It's always someone else's fault. And I need to get to court. I need to my attorney. I need someone to agree with me that I'm right and the other parent is wrong. Let's go back to what you were talking about, the high conflict personality. What is that? I'm sure that goes along with placing blame and it's never their fault, but I want to hear more about that. Yeah, everything we teach at HCI is really focused on this individual that has a high conflict personality and we're not diagnosing. I just want to say that right here and I don't want any of your listeners to become diagnosticians because we, we can't do that, but we can look for patterns of behavior. And so that the, the reason being, we need to be able to adapt what we do so we can manage um, our case, manage our co-parenting, manage our children relationships with children and their relationship with the other parent differently. Okay, so if we go back to what is the true high conflict personality that's driving this conflict, that's driving people crazy, right? The brain works a little bit differently for them. And the reason it's important is because I think there's a, a lot of banding around of this term high conflict personality or high conflict case, but is it really a high conflict, someone with a high conflict personality? If it is, it's going to be a case that's going to have long filings back in court a lot, calling attorneys a lot, firing attorneys a lot, and in self-represented cases, perhaps just coming to court and just seemingly unable to resolve their own conflicts. So they need the court system, the legal system in some way to help. For example, the brain works differently. That's, there's a completely different operating system for someone that has a high conflict personality. Now they may be doing just fine in terms of going to work every day and getting along with their coworkers, all of that. But in the intimate relationship, they're unable to do that. Now, they probably are causing some trouble in other areas, but I'm just saying that workplace might be going fine, but the marital relationship is not. And in that relationship, they may be triggered by a tone of voice because the right brain is listening for tone of voice and assessing, does this sound like a threat to me or not? And if it does, it shuts down the logical thinking, mm -hmm. no, no calm and content emotions. and you're left in a very reactive mode. And for the high conflict personality, that reactive mode means I'm going to either dominate you, I'm going to be superior over you, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get your attention, to be connected to you to the point where I feel like I'm in control. And that's what drives them. Absolutely. When they don't get that satisfaction, when their sphere of safety, is disrupted. So let's say with the narcissistic, true narcissistic personality type, not just someone who we call a narcissist because of vain, but someone who actually has perhaps this high conflict personality disorder, they are driven by a fear of feeling inferior. So their safety zone is to feel superior. As long as I'm in my safety zone, I feel okay. But once that's disrupted, my fear is triggered, I feel inferior, somebody got more attention than me, the, the court agreed with my ex, and I didn't get what I wanted, now I feel inferior. So I'm going to do whatever it takes to feel superior again, which means I'm going to insult you, I'm going to maybe rage, turn the kids against you, those kind of things. So that's the behind it. And, and all of it comes down to when things don't go planned in my head, when things don't go my way. I'm going to have all or nothing thinking. You're my friend or you're my enemy. You're all good. You're all bad. My solutions are all just all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Got to be one way. It's your fault. And it's got to be solved my way. 
unmanaged emotions, meaning when things don't go my way, I'm going to pick up the phone or text or something, scream and yell, be very angry. I can't manage my emotions. Extreme behaviors. I might slash the tires. I might lie. I might manipulate something extreme that 90% of other people would never do. And then all important, I'm going to blame because I truly believe that my distress came from you. I don't understand that it came from within me. We had talked about how unusual it is to go smoothly through a process like this. I was wondering if there's any success stories through custody and parental alienation because this is such a high conflict. I think you'd be hard pressed to find an alienation case or a long-term child custody litigation that doesn't involve at least one person with a high conflict personality because 90% of other people don't go down that path, at least in the severe alienation. Maybe the more mild to moderate doesn't involve as much of a high conflict personality. But yeah, there are some techniques that, that people can use. If we're talking severe alienation, which this is some of the most difficult stuff you can do that you're going to deal with in your life. And so there are small techniques that can be used to make your life a little bit better, but you have to rely often on an attorney, on the courts, on all of the, the professionals involved in these really difficult cases, psychologists and therapists and mediators and everyone. But you can still use the techniques such as for, for verbal communication. One of the biggest areas of trouble is when someone kind of attacks you or you just get into that debate back and forth once again with the, your, your children's other parent. And it's really tempting as a human to just engage like we engage with everyone else and blaming you about something. And you, so you defend yourself. Now you're in an argument, you're in a back and forth that you're never going to win with someone with a high conflict personality. And it just goes on and on. And so we teach a little technique called the ear, using an ear statement. So an ear statement is something showing empathy, attention, and respect. And so we use that in place of an argument or an explanation or defending ourselves because that high conflict person needs it to be in that moment. They need everything to be about them. And so they're yelling and screaming, escalating. And you can say, hey, look, I see that you're really upset about this. That's a near statement. You've made it about them. Their right brain comes back down off the ceiling. The bridge to left brain opens up a bit again. And you might be able to, you're de-escalating. So you're not getting engaged in the back and forth. And it's only after we get someone calm that we can then talk about the parenting schedule. Who's picking up Johnny on Saturday from soccer, right? Those kinds of things. So that's a little technique. If you are in verbal communication. In alienation cases, maybe you're not even having those conversations. But if you are, try a little ear statement. And the, the way to remember it is you got to get people call before, let's think of like a capital B and the number four, before you get them thinking, before you get engaging with them. And yeah. then for written communication, this is probably parents' favorite technique that we teach. It's called the BIF, B-I-F response technique. In as in family law and divorce cases, the emails and text messages are, they blow up and the phones are blowing up with 40 text messages in an evening and it gets ugly and it's hostile and it, it's damaging to your health. It's chronic stress. So when you receive something, you get to make, make a decision whether you need to respond or not. And maybe you don't because a lot of times it's just that person had a fear moment and had a right brain dump into the phone, into the keyboard, and it hit send, now they feel better, and now it's on your lap. A lot of times you don't need to respond, but if you do, write it out, then biff it. Is it brief? Two to five sentences, no more, because you don't want to give them more to come back at you with. More will get you more. <laughs> um, is it informative? Just stick to straight facts. Don't defend yourself. Don't argue. Don't explain. Nothing. Just information. Keep it a friendly. That's the F, the first F. Just keep a friendly tone, civil. It doesn't have to be like over the top. 
I love you. And said, just friendly. And then firm doesn't mean super firm. It has to be hardcore harsh. Firm means that you're just closing it with the statement you need to make. I will see you at McDonald's at seven on Sunday to exchange the kids. Have a good weekend, whatever. That, so it's just telling them what you're going to do. Now, if you need a response back from them, if you need to ask, is McDonald's okay? Or then you want to ask that as the last question, but make them focus on a choice between two things, such as, do you want to meet at McDonald's or Taco Bell on Saturday? That makes them focus on a choice that's a thinking activity instead of an arguing activity. So that, and then don't put any advice, admonishments, or apologies in any of those. And that's biffing it. And this will make your life way, way easier. Yeah. So Megan, I just want to touch on a couple of things there. One, let's talk about, Mick is laughing because he knows where I've been. And I can relate to many parents out there. But let's talk about when we're talking high conflict, I want you to go back to where you were talking about where the parent can look crazy and they are very high conflict and it just spends them in whatever is triggered, uses a trigger, will send them into a spiral and they could do lots of different things. Some of the triggers or non-triggers could be, let's say it this way, some of your parents that are co-parenting that has their head on straight is at their wits end, right? And they are the one that looks like the crazy person because the high conflict person has made them this way. So how do you differ? How do you def define the difference there? How do you figure that out? How do you figure who's a high conflict and who is just literally on the defense and at their wits end and, and doesn't have anything else to do? And they look defensive when they go in and, and they're always feeling attacked so they have this guard up yeah it's, it's it's such a good question and it's so common it sounds like you've seen that a few times when we're dealing with high conflict a, a high conflict co-parent it is crazy making it is absolutely crazy making because they're saying things to you behind the scenes and then showing the charming self in front of the court and for other professionals and maybe your friends and family and all that while they're just excoriating you and making your life miserable and hell. <laughs> so uh, we developed the web method. And so we're listening to words. And we want, if they're using words like, you're the enemy, you respected and disrespected me, I deserve to be respected. First of all, when you meet someone that's saying stuff like that, it's probably a good idea to avoid them. But if they're making you, this is future advice, right? If you're dating, looking, radar. Move on. Yeah. Well, that, that, yes. yeah. We wrote this book, Dating Radar, for young people, like high school era, college kids to read before they get married. And the only people reading it are those who've been through a high conflict before. Yeah. Like, because well, they don't understand it. Yeah. They, what they're getting into. And so back to your question if you're, if you're in this crazy making situation and there, you're a human and your brain is going to react. When you're being attacked, you're going to be in the tightened anxiety state to begin with. And then you get these little attacks and little digs and all of that. And you, it is very common for the non-high conflict person to lose their, maybe in front of the professionals or in front of the court because the high conflict person is poking them under the table, so to speak. So they can look really crazy. So. If you are that person and you really lost your cool in front of people, that's okay. Just repair it. Just say something like, I don't, I really, a lot of tension's been building up and I don't normally react this way. I'm, I like to be a very reasonable person. And what you want to be, what you aim to be all along a high conflict case, which can be you know, 15, 18 years, you have to just continue to show yourself as the reasonable parent. Reasonable par parents are good parents, right? You do the right things for your kids, but for yourself, you are taking care of yourself. You are using flexible thinking. You're managing your emotions. You're giving yourself encouraging statements that I'm going to survive this and I am a good parent. And you forgive yourself if you do lose your cool once in a while. 
but just keep showing yourself and your kids that you're a reasonable parent and that will bleed through to all the professionals involved in your case. Yeah, I think that's good advice. And I will say what helped is you touched on the BIF method, which I did use that actually, and that was huge. But in addition, mm-hmm. is I think you have to give yourself boundaries because those emails or those communications can go on all day mm-hmm. long, right? Back and forth. So if you don't stop, and I, th- I thought it was a great saying that I heard one time is you're divorced now or you're separated. You are not, you don't have to respond to that person right away. I think on the court apps, they give you 24, 48 hours to respond. So take a breath. If you need to, I got to a point where I actually had to not respond during work time. Like I wouldn't even look at it because it would give me anxiety. So yep. it was after work when I was by myself when I knew I was at a calm place and I was ready and willing to receive whatever message or attack that was going to happen. And then when I received it, you don't have to respond right away. I love what you said, right? I learned that too. You don't have to respond right away. You can sit on that for 24 hours. You can sit on it for 15 hours. You can sleep on it, whatever, right? Formulate a good Biff response so that you're happy with what you did too, right? You don't regret anything that you might say or might harm you down the road in court. And then I love your technique on the ear. And I, just to repeat that, so the techniques to use, you said was empathy, attention, and respect. And so when you are talking to them, you want to empathize with them. You definitely want to give them credit which is sometimes hard for people to swallow, especially if you're in a very high conflict divorce, right? So you want to give them that empathy. You want to give them attention. You want to give them that respect, which probably at the end of the marriage, you weren't giving anyways. So (laughs) that's very tough, right? To switch gears on that. And that is a lot of, takes a lot of mental strength, a lot of mental strength in it and in your anxiety. So I definitely recommend having a therapist and working through that, but those are very good technique. So thank you. I just wanted to highlight those. No, you bet. And just to end cap that, the the ear statements, people get a little confused sometimes. Well, which one do I use? Just use anything that's that just shows that you're making it about them. Oh, that sounds frustrating. Tell me more. The right, the, literally the right brain is going, oh, thank you. I needed that. <laughs> the right brain is craving something to be about them. And someone who needs to feel superior, the last thing you want to do, like you said, is to give someone who's demanding respect, you don't want to say to them, I respect you. Because it's just like grinds against everything you want to say and what you're feeling. But it, it, like you said, it's discipline. This is not easy stuff. But if you stick to the rules, to these skills, you start turning around the relationship where it's not managing you anymore. You're managing it. And that is the cheat. And you really have to put on your big girl or boy pants on and realize I can't, I can't do this the way I would do this in a normal relationship or normal divorce. This is not normal. Mm -hmm. It's, and I liken it somewhat. And I know this is severe, but let's say cancer, right? If you get a cancer diagnosis, you're going to go and get probably a surgery, you're going to get chemo, you're going to get maybe radiation, whatever. You have to be disciplined to fight it. This, you have to be disciplined to manage it yes. <laughs> or, or else it will manage you. And you can't be like the nice person you think you are and want to be and that you probably are. You have to be a strategic, mm-hmm. disciplined person. And the more you get practice doing it over and over, it just becomes a matter of course. And the long-term effect of it is, even though you're not changing their personality, you're managing it and keeping things calmer, which ultimately helps your children and helps you. Use the ear when you can. Use Biff. I wanted to oh, follow up on something you said. Oh, about you can think about it overnight or 24 hours. Oftentimes, I've written a Biff response and, or just an email. And then the next day I come back to work and I look at, oh, it's sitting in my drafts. It didn't send. And then I read it and I'm so glad that it didn't send because it seemed like a good idea yesterday, but today it doesn't. 
So yes. I would definitely, if you have the feeling that, oh, this is a yucky, uh, then go ahead and write it out. Put it in a Word doc if you have to or something else. Sit on it for a day, look at it the next day, and then Biff it. Because what Biff does, in essence, is it extracts out anything that's going to light the thing on fire, light the other person on fire, and get you something back. So it's a huge management tool. And then last end cap, I'm sorry, I'm really rambling, but setting limits is equally important to everything. Mm -hmm. And having those boundaries you talked about, Kendra, is just everything. I think you should say, look, I will be, here's what I'm going to do. And this is what setting limits means. It's not like we're all afraid of, of setting boundaries. Oh, I don't like doing boundaries. I'm not good at boundaries. Okay, let's just put all that in the garbage and say, I'm going to set limits instead. And the way I set limits is I'm going to tell that person what I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm going to be emailing you the kids report cards once a quarter. I'm going to send you the kids the once a week. I'm going to email you on Saturdays at 10 a.m. with an update of everything regarding the kids, okay? So you take the wind out of their sails by doing that and you're setting limits and you do it with ear so you're not aggravating the brain. And then it's not the tail wagging the dog. Now you've got things in the right order. Yeah, and you can and I will the relationship better. I will tell you, Megan, it is not easy coming from a person that did it. It is tough. So it's not as easy as what we're talking about. It makes you nauseous. You want to puke afterwards, especially if you have to do it in person during a moderation or something. You Ugh. Lots of emotions, right? Your heart's beating. You feel like you haven't taken a breath for an hour while you were in there. But I will tell you that the first time I failed, and, and this is going back to what you were talking about, give yourself some grace, because the first time I failed, I reacted to everything. And I want to answer all their questions because I was the mom. And I was active in their lives, right? So I knew all the answers, right? I took them to all their doctor's appointments and dentist appointments and eye appointments. And so I was answering everything and not giving him the chance to talk. So it was looking like I was the crazy person. Yeah. And when yep. we went back for the second counseling session, I had a come to Jesus moment with myself and said, okay, this didn't go like I thought it would go the first time. So I'm going to regroup retrain myself, listen to a few more podcasts, read a few more books, and I'm going to approach it differently. And I will tell you when I did, I went in and it was not easy sitting there in that chair. And every time they would ask a question, I would turn to my ex and say, that's great. What do you think? What do you think we should do? Oh, and nice. it upset him so bad that they noticed his hands were clenched. His fingers were turning white because he had clenched fist. And they called him out on it. And they said, why are you getting so upset? Because I asked every time and he was so uncomfortable in that position because he's always thought I was the one making the calls and directing things. And he could just sit back and I would just dig my own grave. So I walked out of there instead of crying, I was smiling and so happy. And I will tell you, I called a couple of friends and family and they didn't understand what I was saying. And to me, it was a huge thing to overcome. So. I will tell you, if you are in the throes of this, it is tough. It is so tough to do. And you, but in the end, you will be so proud of yourself that you did it and you were able to transform and you see it visually in front of you happening. And it's so much easier then. It is. You're right. And I bet you felt very empowered. Yes. That day. You must yes. have, and, and going forward because you get it once and then it gets addictive when you have that empowered moment. Wow, I did it. We still are going to screw up down the road. It's, it's, it's they're sure. just, they're still going to get under your skin, but it, it's addictive when you feel that empowerment. And I like what you, where we're doing, just turn, flip that around. <clears throat> and because like people tell you who they are and the clenched fist and the white knuckles, there'll be finger tapping and all of a sudden the foot starts to wiggle or tap, or you can see the, the facial expression change in those things. You managed it. You turned it around. And that's, that's critical. And one thing we teach in mediation, and it can be done just in everyday co-parenting as well, is just use proposals. So we'll use ear for de-escalating people. Use BIF for email and text and writing, commu written communication. And then use proposals 
It's sort of what we see a lot of parents saying, I'm going to do this. You're, I want you to do this. And instead, turn it into a proposal. I propose that I pick up the kids from swim lessons this weekend and that you pick them, them up next weekend. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, so there's a two-parter here. You're making a proposal, which is a thinking activity. You do it with a calm voice, which keeps the brain calmer and less threatened. And then you make the proposal and then ask if there's any questions about it. That shows the person respect. They like that. Mm -hmm. And if it, and asking a question is a thinking activity. So it, if we put things in, forms of a, in the form of a proposal instead of a dictate, you're probably going to get more progress. Mm -hmm. And because they're going to be less on the defensive and they may not like your proposal and they know that uh, I'm oh. going to make my own proposal. That's fine. What's your proposal? Mm -hmm. Propos then you've got them thinking and you can get somewhere. So we really advocate the proposal thing and then asking if they have any questions because there's a lot of cognitive distortions and things and you want to make sure that things are clarified. And it's similar to what the technique you were using turning that around. You're saying, can, do you have any questions about my proposal? And they feel valued. Yeah. Because they like it to be all about them. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I know, Mick, we sidetracked a little bit. I tend to do that. <laughs> Bring us back to <laughs> what we were talking about. <laughs> Brings back to reality. No, just kidding. So I had a two-sided question because there are things that you can teach and you can manage before you're in a high conflict situation. So that's one part of the question. But then subsequent to that is that, what do you do when you are actually in that high conflict situation? So there's a way to prepare yourself. And then there's a way to say, oh, wait a minute, this is now getting extreme and extraordinary. So what's the difference and what would you recommend both before and then actually in a high conflict situation? What should you do? When you are pre-situation, you can learn the skills, get skilled up about the things we're, we're talking about. We teach these skills across the board, whether in a workplace conflict, a family dispute, or divorce, and our neighbor dispute, anywhere. And so you use the skills, but you can't, or learn the skills, but you can't really understand them until you're in that situation with that person and your heart rate is elevated and you're in your own little bit of fight or flight. Right? You aren't going to know what you're going to do until you're in that moment. And so we have to practice using the skills so that we, when we are in, in that stressful moment, we can remember to do it because guess what happens? When you're in that stressful moment, your reactive brain is going to do the same thing the other person's brain is doing. Those is doing it because they're of a different reason, but now your brain is going to be on alert. And when your brain's on alert, you're not so much accessing your logical, rational side, right? And it's hard to think. And so that's why we need to have, you're in your react reacting brain. And so you need these simple little skills that you can go, oh, yeah, what was I supposed to use? It's because it's not going to count something super logical isn't going to come out in that moment. And instead you're going to have to go, oh, okay, I have to give in your statement. Oh, it, that, that sounds like you're upset. Okay. So that's my advice is you've got to practice those things and you're not really going to know it and hey, you're not going to get good at it until you get lots of practice at it. And still once in a while you can get hijacked by surprise and you'll lose your cool again. But mostly if you, you remind yourself before you're doing the, the exchange of the kids, or you've got to be at the, you know, the, the graduation together with that person. And if, if, if just plan as much as you can, just remind yourself, I'm going to use ear statements. I'm going to just keep my mouth shut. And I will share this with you. This is one of my top tips is. Yeah, you know, okay. You got to get ready for top this. Tip. <laughs> the top I tip. Did. Here we go. All right. We're ready, <laughs> Megan. Listeners are listening. I'm going to make t-shirts. I'm going to make t-shirts and everything, caps and whatever. Just do a lot of time in, in high conflict. You just do the SSN, shut up, smile, and nod. I know it's not, that doesn't sound that exciting, but it's actually probably one of the best skills you can have. Just shut up, smile, and nod instead of 
So it's basically the same as biting your tongue, but it just sounds a lot more exciting and fun when you say shut up, smile and nod. I've watched it. I've watched people who are married to a high conflict person who drives them absolutely nuts, makes them crazy. And the way they survive it, a lot, a lot of it is to just shut up, smile and nod. I've seen people do it. And so I've started teaching it and it's, and I've done it myself a lot. Just, you don't need to argue with the high conflict brain. You don't need to defend yourself against the high conflict brain. Instead, you can give an ear statement or you can shut up, smile and nod um, and you can set a limit. There's lots, you have a few tools that are really simple, but that one will keep you from, it could prevent you from ending up in a domestic violence situation because a lot of times those things, those are, those result from arguments that just escalate, escalate and escalate. And I'm not s suggesting by any means that anyone just be in an unsafe situation, but I'm saying as a management tool to keep an argument from escalating, sometimes just using your statements, sometimes just shut up, smile and nod. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. And I was going to say that practicing really does make a whole lot of sense. I haven't ridden a bike in a long time, but there is such a thing as physical memory and your body remembers. So I'm sure I could hop on a bike anytime because I know how to ride a bike because I haven't done it in a while. I tried the same thing with basketball. That was more of a challenge, but I could do it in my head, but you do things over and over again and you have muscle memory and it gets easier. And I think what you're saying, it can apply to a high conflict situation that if you do it and you practice it, just like anything else, you get better at it and you have muscle memory because everything starts just going in harmony because you've done it before. And it's like riding a bike, you've done it. You can do it again. Absolutely. And it's the reason you do have to practice is because these are biological things that are happening in your brain. You don't even know they're happening. The other person doesn't know it's happening. And so we get hooked, emotionally hooked. You feel it in your gut. You feel that zinger. You feel it going up through your chest into your face. You feel your heart rate. And it can be really hard to overcome those things. So if you have a skill to grasp onto and remind yourself to do and then practice it each time, it does get easier. And you do get that muscle memory, but it is the opposite. This is very critical. It's the opposite of what you feel like doing. Oh, and it's yeah. the opposite of what you want to do, right? Yes. And so that's why you, uh, another reason you have to practice because it's, and like you said, Kendra, it's being the adult. It, you have to be disciplined with this stuff. Mm -hmm. Period. Do. And so how do people practice? How do you recommend that they practice? Because we can deal with high conflict anywhere right? Whether it's workplace, friends, maybe we hopefully don't have friends like that, but we, I'm sure there are, uh, or acquaintances, yeah. marriages, divorces. So how do we practice? Yeah, it's, if you're in a divorce, that's going to be probably the most challenging one or family disputes. You're in it all the time, unless you live a long way away <laughs> and they don't have your phone number or your email. But we, so we've, we think it's pretty critical to practice. So we have a live lab on our website where people can just pop in and, and practice, practice the skills doing, doing scenarios. But there's things like I just did a training for workplace, a big company a few weeks ago, and it was a two day training. And so I taught the skills on day one and day two, we came back together and I said, do you have any questions from yesterday? Not da, da, da. And this guy raised his hand and said, I just have to tell you, yesterday I was thinking some of this stuff you were teaching was a little bit hokey, ear statements, blah, blah, blah. But he says, then I went home last night from work and my neighbor came out and met me at my car and just started griping and moaning about my tree, da, da, da. And he says, my blood pressure went up, my heart rate went up, and I caught myself and I used an ear statement that you taught me. And he said, I de-escalated that situation instantly something that would have turned into a, we're both really angry and wouldn't have spoken again, or it would turn into some big neighbor dispute. But he says, I de-escalated it and got him on my team. We agreed on what we were going to do. So. Wow. That's a great you know, story. That is great. Over the fence yeah, conversation with the neighbor, he used it and he was hesitant even on the skills you were giving him and he used it in that situation and it worked. Yeah. Great. And he, I guarantee you, he didn't feel like doing, using it. And I guarantee you, he didn't, wasn't used to doing it, but he was like, all right, I'll give this a go. I learned this today. 
so that my point is it isn't hard. This like isn't rocket science. You just have to remember to do it and be disciplined enough to do it. And I think too, if you're, you can utilize these skills wherever, like you said, right? With a neighbor, that was a great example that he had. And I think if you're going through a high conflict divorce, you can maybe practice at work and using these skills. I know I did. It came oh, in handy. Point. I had somebody that was attacking me on an email and my first reaction, is I type the email and then I'm like, wait, and I back up and I rewrite it. And I did exactly what you did. I biffed it out. We'll call it. <laughs> <laughs> and I oh let gosh. it sit overnight because I don't have to send it right away. And then I responded the next morning. And it's not just for you either on limitations, but I think it's for the other person it de-escalates because then they're not yeah. so upset either because it's been 12 or 24 hours or whatever. And so I think it's a great time to practice on them too is when you're at work. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And you just spurred another thought in my brain uh, when they, High conflict people have a lot of internal distress. They think it came from you, but it really didn't. It came from within themselves. It's just this anxiety spiking all over the place. And so that they'll have this stored up in their reactive brain, whatever gripe it is, whatever internal distress it is. And because technology gives us such easy access now to download that, it's like this right brain dump directly into that keyboard. And... We just have to remember that when we receive one of those, you have to ask yourself, was just this, was this just like a right brain dump, <laughs> like a reactive brain dump? And they, it, it's, they're feeling better now and they, they go on and forget about it. And we're lying in bed at night, perseverating about this. How am I going to respond to it? Da, da, da. And it's taking up space in your brain. And you, if you just let it go, sleep on it, biff it. You have a tool. You have a tool that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And you can decide whether you respond at all. And if you do, you biff it. And then there's your tool. It's gone. You don't have to let this control your life, ruin your life. And you get to decide how much you're going to let it impact your life. Mm -hmm. And if you're co-parenting for 15 years, let's think about the number of Saturdays that you're going to give <laughs> to thinking about this perseverating about all of it and how, what am I going to do? And instead, I could be just using a few tools here and there, and it'll help manage, make things easier. And for the most part, it really does. Strong personality disordered individuals are going to make strong custody and alienation cases. And I'm, they're not easy. And it's not as easy as just a BIF response that's going to cure everything. It's but I've seen some miracles though. happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yes, that's it. It's continued practice and, and it's for you. And sometimes you, when you stop fighting, and that's what these tools do, they're about stopping fighting and you're just managing things. Then that escalated person can come down and some of them can then get to some healing or get through some mediation and be more reasonable. So there's some really good outcomes sometimes. Yeah. I think you can use the ear method too. I Again, I haven't heard of it until today. Thinking back at work, I implemented this years ago, right? Not knowing what this method was, but just showing empathy, respect. If you're going to disagree with somebody or have a work conflict with somebody because you're not on the same page or you want to think separate ideas are better, one idea is better than the other. If you just show them attention and empathy and give them credit for the idea they brought to the table and say, I just have a little bit different perspective on it that I'd like to share with you if you think that's okay. So you can practice daily, right? <laughs> and, and it works in all one. areas of our lives. I guess that's one thing to take away from this is it's not just high conflict divorce either. It's the, you're using and practicing tools that are, are good throughout your life in all different aspects. Such a great point. Such a great point. It, it's, and I had not even thought about that where you could just Take, just do that. Just practice that at work. Practice it with everyone. So then when you do run into that high conflict person or you've got that person in your... <laughs> it's much easier. Because it's already it's trained, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 You're already trained on how to do that. And I don't know, do you have a recommendation on starting with email over in-person communication? Is there one better than the other on on where to start? 
with these skills? I'd say start just use when you have to do something in writing, use Biff. When you are in person, use ear. Yeah. And use proposals and set limits. When you set limits, use ear. <laughs> use it um, all. Use it all. It's just, you got it. Grab what you need to here and there. And then one thing I haven't talked about is helping them think in terms of options instead of they're all or nothing. And this is where a lot of parents get stuck is the other parent saying, it's going to be my way or the highway. And so you can give a little ear and an ear can be something as much as, as focused as just keeping a very calm, matter of fact voice and giving them eye contact, showing them that attention and just say, I have some ideas. I was wondering if you have any ideas or thoughts about that. What options can you use? So we don't ask about what they're feeling. How do you feel about that? You just say, what options can you think of? It's a very all or nothing. Remember, one of the key defining characteristics is all or nothing thinking. So they're not thinking in terms of options that, oh, instead of dropping the kids at McDonald's, we could use this other one. They don't think that way. Mm -hmm. They want it their way. I want McDonald's and that's it. Right? So you introduce them, guide them lead the horse to water, right? Mm -hmm. Showing them that there are options um, available, <laughs> that option, there is an option planned. They don't know that. And yeah. so you do it non-offensively and, and it, and just try it. Yep. Try it. Yep. Good point. You have to practice it. But a question along the lines of, we know people and we know some of the things, if you know that person, what sets them off, but it is also might be in a more general setting. What would you say are some of the warning signs that a conflict is escalating? And when you're in that situation, what can you do about it? Because people do certain things. They have ticks, they start tapping, they have white knuckles, all those things. But what are some of the signs that are in a high conflict that it's approaching that you can start preparing yourself and then integrate some of the ideas that you're discussing? That's an excellent question because many times it's going to come as a surprise. Because the way the brain works is it's when it goes into that fear mode. So let's say the superior personality needs to feel superior. They're, as soon as they feel it, that fear is triggered of, of feeling inferior, it shuts down the logical thinking process in six tenths of a second. And so they wow. can be just really normal and fine and then flip like that. And you're like, whoa, what just happened? And now you're, oof, and what do I do? <laughs> and you're, then maybe you're emotionally hooked. So it, it can be really hard to prepare in advance or see it coming. If you're in a co-parenting situation, you do know that person pretty well. You know what their tricks are. Ch tricks. Figures. Sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's, it's near Halloween. We're good. Trick or treat, right? That's all we're thinking anymore. <laughs> exactly. It really went well, didn't it? Um, um, but we, we know those things. And so you just can, you can expect it. Because it's kind of interesting when we surveyed people about like at a training what are your thoughts about a high conflict situation or case or a person and across the board someone will say oh it's just unpredictable but that's not true it's high conflict people that are the most predictable of all because they're going to tell you who they are i need to be respected i felt insulted They'll come in with charm often at first, but then it's this, I'm insulted. I need to be respected. If I'm not respected, I'm not going to see my, if my kids don't respect me, I'm never going to see them again. I don't need them in my life. There's things that other people would never say. Mm -hmm. So they'll tell you, you don't care about me. You never cared about me. I'm going to destroy you. The, the antisocial personality, when they, when they feel dominated by you, they want to destroy you. It's just, and they'll tell you that. They'll lie constantly. That's another tell. There's so many tells out there. The longer I do the work, it just, you just, then when we teach people this stuff, it's, they start to feel like they have some x-ray vision goggles or something that you can finally see the structured pattern behind it. And when, this, when things don't go their way, this is how they're going to react and behave. So you just got to get smarter. And you're going to counteract all of that so that 
they don't drive you crazy. Yeah. I think the hard thing for us to realize and when we're in a marriage like that, when we're in it, we don't see it. We don't tend to see it. When we get out of it and then there's children involved in custody, then we're like, whoa, what just happened? Because it tends to explode or we're just seeing it from a different perspective. And I say we speaking for all the listeners. It's typically we do see that just from a different lens. And so I think getting help with it right away, realizing this is what you're in, getting help with it at the very beginning before it goes too long and can interfere with custody time. But right when the separation starts saying, hey, I think I might have a high conflict co-parent situation coming down the path and I I just want to equip myself. You are going to invest so much more in yourself and money and spending money the right way versus spending money in the courts and on attorneys and things that will get you nowhere because that's not psychological. What we're talking about is psychological. And so the only way to take care of the problem is to get ahead of it and to learn a little bit about that psychology, whether you want to or not, and the tools and equipping and and getting ahead of what you probably see coming. Yep, 100%. And I like what you said. It's so true. We we don't necessarily see it so clearly when we're in it. We're just too close to it. And I I see it in long-term marriages and often in family disputes that even those, I see psychologists and very experienced mental health professionals who are sometimes in very high conflict marriages or family relationships or even work relationships and don't see it because they're just too close. And then they get out of it and they're like, oh my gosh, how did I not see this? (laughs) Or our friends tell us and our family, right? And they're like, oh my gosh, we've seen that for years. And I'm like, why didn't you say something? That's what we don't feel. Why why didn't you tell me before this? We weren't Um, listening. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we don't want to listen. And we don't want to realize that things, yeah. And we don't want to think that things... We've made such a difficult or such a maybe horrendous choice yeah. of a person to be our children's other parent. And we are just, and there's a whole thing about survival. We're in, we're, we're survival creatures. Yeah. So we're trying to make the best of things and we don't want to be on that divorce list and we don't want to be a statistic and we don't want our kids to, it's just, it can be really hard, hard stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, Megan, as we start to wrap up, I want you to go back and touch on this live lab that you have on the website and how you can also help people and other tools that you have and how they can get in contact with you. Oh, you bet. Our website is highconflictinstitute.com. And uh, we have a lot of other URLs and things, but you can always find us at that, highconflictinstitute.com. Then... There's a, a section of the website that's for professionals like attorneys and that, and it's training for them. And there's a site that's just for individuals, and it's mostly for parents and co-parents and going through divorce, because that's the majority of, of people who are touched by high conflict. Mm-hmm. So you can find the live lab in there. And in that, we teach, you know, how to do BIF, how to use EAR. Do, we do role play where you actually have to start practicing it and using it we have a little thing where we help we call it the decisions and agreements model where we can help teach you how to make decisions that are really tough in high conflict situations because they high conflict people present us with dilemmas and we we need a way to 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 make decisions so we've got that and then we have a a course specifically for high conflict uh, divorce and child custody called New Ways for Families, and that can be accessed in that individual part of the website too. And it's a course that's designed specifically for high-conflict divorce. And there are some other programs out there that are for, and I'm not knocking any of them. All I can say is that ours is specifically formulated Mm -hmm. for and designed for the high-conflict personality, uh, how to take care of yourself, and how to learn all these skills and tools. And so we have that. We have conflict playbook. We have lots of things there that, that I think are pretty helpful. Lots of books like Biff for co-parent communication. 
you name it. It's all on our website and we'd love to answer any questions. We also do consultations. You can book a consultation with either myself or Bill Eddy and Bill's family law high conflict guru. So if you're in a legal case, particularly child custody or alienation and feeling stuck, you can do it book that directly, or you can ha even have your attorney come too. So there are lots and lots of options. We just try to help every way we can. Perfect. I love that. So you have books, you have a course. How long is the course? Or is it like a certain number of it's weeks a, or? Yeah. So it's online. It's 12 sessions and it's a, that, which is about 12 hours. There's journals in there. There's all different kinds of things. We try to make it uh, not too boring. <laughs> And then we offer coaching along with it. And that's what I recommend highly is to do have a little bit of coaching with it so that you can really have someone that's skilled in this take you through some scenarios and help talk to you about the things that you're going through that you need to make some decisions about or do differently. So highly recommend it. Perfect. So you have courses, you have one-on-one -on -one consultations, you have books, you have all these different ways to get in contact with you guys and you can just go to the website in order to get in contact with you so one of the things you mentioned that i want to touch on real fast is you have a section for attorneys so you mm -hmm. counsel attorneys and judges on high conflict and if you do i would recommend the listeners don't just take the podcast and say hey give it to your attorney and say, you need to go to this high conflict institute, listen to this. Do so you understand what I'm saying on what my other parent is doing? And, and maybe, maybe you could get in touch with Megan and Megan could reach out to the firm <laughs> anonymously <laughs> and encourage them or send some information, but don't take this podcast and give it to your attorney and say, Hey, you got to listen to this. Just take my advice. I've done it. Made a mistake. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That's sometimes it's they like to find these resources on their own and don't want someone else telling them what to do. But we found generally that like we've seen some parents give their attorney one of our books, like High Conflict People in Legal Disputes. Hey, have you ever read this? I was reading it. This seems to be like something I'm dealing with. I don't know. And it seems like the the attorneys who are really interested in understanding this the high conflict personality will take it on board and look around. They might read an article on the website or something and go, oh, okay, that's what's happening. So they can get really interested. And there's some great attorneys out there and great judges and they want to do the right thing and learning along like the rest of us. Yes. Megan, maybe you can even implement, they could practice using ear when they're presenting this information to them. I, I understand you're a great attorney. You're doing a great job. And I just happen to come across this. And I would really like your opinion on what you think about this. Could you read the book oh, or read fine. a little bit and get back to me? <laughs> Look at that. In practice, right there. You have a proposal. I got an A+. Plus. Oh, that's a proposal too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Megan, you have been such a pleasure to have on. Gosh, you gave us so many different things to think about that we had not heard. In this, I just, I love the techniques that you mentioned between the ear that we keep mentioning, which again is the empathy, attention, respect, the BIF, which is your brief, informative, friendly, and firm. And you have the proposal, as Mick mentioned, the web method, giving options versus all or nothing, the shut up, smile, and nod. I could go on and on. This is amazing. You got it all. I was... Really impressed you got all that written down. <laughs> and yeah, it seems like a lot when I hear it back like that. But it's simple little skills. as You just have to practice them and remember to use them. Then it, it works for high conflict. Thank you very much, Megan. It was phenomenal. That was a really, really informative session. So thanks for being our guest. We really appreciate your time and taking some time out to chat with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great way to start our second year. So beginning of the second year of the aftermath. Thanks for listening in. Of course, remember to like, to subscribe, to share, positively review on Apple Podcasts to keep the podcast episodes coming your way. Until next time, Deus Volt.